I am going to be out of town tomorrow and Friday, so I've got a conference in Grand Rapids, and I won't be back till Sunday. You will have class on Friday, though. One of my good friends, also one of my colleagues, Dr. Miles Smith, is going to be taking class on Friday. So you'll have him here at this time on Friday. And I would like for you to have read, uh, finished up the Greek section, not the Hellenistic, but the Hellenic section that you have. So read the Plato and Aristotle please, uh, for Miles, and I know he's going to be wanting to lead a discussion on that, so be prepared to talk. Uh, I mean, it'll be great. So I will have office hours today, so I, I don't normally on Wednesday, but since I'm going to be gone the next two days, I thought it would be good. Uh, I'll be there today from 12 to 1.30, so if you need to get a hold of me, do so. If, for whatever reason, though, you, you want to email me or send me something, that's fine, too. It may take me just a little bit to get back to you, but I will get back to you. So if you want to email me, a uh, thesis statement or an outline or a draft of a paper, feel free to do so. I've been, a number of you have already stopped by and I've been really impressed with what you've done. Uh, it's been great, so thank you for that. And I look forward to seeing other people with papers as well. You're also welcome, of course, just to turn your paper in when you're ready next week, but uh, that, that's up to you. If you would like my advice on it, feel free to seek that out and I'll give you whatever advice that I can uh, related to that. I also I graded your quizzes and you guys did really well overall so thank you for that. Uh, I, in fact I, I wondered either I'm getting soft or you're just really good because so, <laughs> they were a lot of 100s on that. Um, so anyway good job. So I appreciate the kind of time that you put into it. It, it does definitely mean a lot. Uh, it makes teaching much much more interesting. Okay so today and I hope you guys know, right? I, mean, I, I hope you know this, especially as freshmen. Your, your professors should not want you to do poorly. Right? They should want you to do well. I want you to learn. So when you do really well on the quizzes, it's, that's very, very good. Uh, it, it does make me question if I'm being too easy, but it's also, yeah, it, it's good. So that's a, a good thing for my soul. Yeah, Kristen. Be getting them back. Yeah, at the end of class, I'll hand it back. I've got them right here. If I forget, remind me. But yeah, I, I've got them there to, to get them back to you. So... But I thought it'd be best at the end of class, so you could wait with anticipation. <laughs> so, good. Okay, so today uh, we're doing one of my favorite things in this class, and I love this class anyway, but we're going to talk about three of my favorite figures, or at least start talking about them. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And we're really, we're really getting into the heart of what it means to be Western, what it means to be a part of the Occident, what it means to be a citizen of the West as we're thinking about Socrates, especially here in the Crito, and the way that he deals with his own problems and justices or injustices that we can talk about here in a moment in Athens. So I've given you on the board the dates of these three men. And I don't even really know as a historian how to explain this without being incredibly humbled. But if you look at their dates, you have Socrates, who is the teaching master of Plato, and then you have Plato, who's the teaching master of Aristotle. To have three men like this in three successive generations is almost outrageous. This just doesn't happen in history that often, that you have three such important figures coming right after each other, one generation after another. And they do really blend together. So if you've had a chance to read much Socrates, and I know you've read the Crito for today, but if you've had the chance to read much Socrates, you really do get the sense that Socrates in some way is kind of speaking as the voice of the universe and he certainly believes that and he's trying to explain a number of different things trying to figure out who it is that we are what we're here for what our purpose is and what our lives can really mean uh, he gets to the fundamental questions in fact to study Socrates is really to study the liberal arts he is kind of the great liberal artist in the way that he's thinking about things so what we know of Socrates, almost all of it comes from Plato. What we know of Aristotle comes from his students as well. But almost everything that we have from Socrates, with the exception of, of one play that you don't need to know, it was by Aristophanes called The Clouds, really everything that we have comes from Plato. And so it's almost impossible to separate Plato from Aristotle from Socrates. And yet of the three, we can definitely say that there is a Socratic and Platonic way of thinking, and then there is an Aristotelian way of thinking. And they're not the same thing. Aristotle takes the teachings of Plato and of Socrates in a much different direction than I think Socrates or Plato 
would have recognized. So the way that we understand these three, these three greats of Western civilization, is that, and I think this should be obvious from everything you've read and everything we've talked about up to this point, everything that these three philosophers are concerned about is really about the question of order. Where do we fit in in the order of things? What is the natural order of the existence of the universe? Where does the earth fit in in the universe? Where does the human person fit in within the universe? Where does God fit in with the universe? So those questions of what is man, what is God, what is man's relationship to God, these are central to the Socratic and Platonic way of thinking. And they're not just concerned about the order as it's created by the God, but they're also very concerned by the order as we participate in it. So as we'll see towards the end of this class today, Socrates sees every one of us as moral agents. That is, each one of us in this room, each person who has ever existed, is an independent moral agent. And the more we do good, better will we understand good. And the more we do bad, more will we, will we become mired in the bad. And so we choose the good over and over and over again because it means that our good will help the good that exists here but when we choose the bad or the ill, we also not only bring society down, but we bring ourselves down. So the order of one's soul has a reflection in the order of one's existence, and the order of one's existence has a reflection in the order of things in the polis. So it does matter how we act. The individual has a huge responsibility to be good and to do good and to promote that kind of order and that kind of justice. But that order, as they understand it, is also a deeply organic order. And I'll, I'll try and explain this and break down the universe as they saw it. So you can see what I have on the board here. Socrates, of course, talks repeatedly about his understanding of the God. And that's translated as Zeus. But we can also translate that when you take the word theo from theology from this. We also take the word deus in Latin, meaning God, from this as well. So those of you who are familiar with scripture, and we're going to talk a lot about Christianity today, strangely enough, even though we're dealing with a pagan here. For those of you who are familiar with Christianity, there's a great moment where St. Paul is in Athens trying to convert the various Stoics and the Epicureans, the various philosophers in Athens. And he says, as one of your poets has said, in him we move and live and have our being. So Acts 17, incredible moment in history where Paul does this. And of course, Paul is trying to get the Athenians to understand that the unknown God is the true God, and he's trying to get them to recognize that he's evangelizing. But as he does so, by taking this line, in him we move and live and have our being, he is playing directly into, very properly so, into the hands of the Epicureans and the Stoics because the Stoics had had a hymn to God that said, in Zeus we move and live and have our being. So when Paul says, in him we move and live and have our being, he's obviously not referencing Zeus directly, but we can see that his God, the Socratic God, is at least related or a foreshadowing, as many people have taken it, of the Christian God and the very words that we use show how close that is. Now for us, I want to be a little bit careful here. Our word that we actually use, God, is an Anglo-Saxon term, and uh, it, it's not related to the Latin or to the Greek. But when we look at the Latin and the Greek, clearly all of this is related from Zeus, the head of the gods. And there's a pretty clear delineation there, looking from one to another. But here's where we see a difference, and I think a pretty major difference between the Jewish and Christian God and what we see with the Socratic God. The story that Socrates and Plato tell about the god is that there is this being that they call the celestial king, this not all-powerful but extremely powerful being who would be their god, the celestial king. And the celestial king maybe has an origin, maybe doesn't, unlike, obviously, the Trinitarian god, which is eternal and has no origin, but is in himself the origin and the end of all things, at least as we believe in the Judeo-Christian tradition. But this God, the celestial king, exists. And what happens is 
after a certain time of his existence, he becomes restless and bored. He wants to do something, and he looks across the universe, and he sees two things. He sees beautiful forms, the good, the true, and the beautiful. Perfect forms, ideals, that he sees as pre-existing. So there is an absolute true, there's an absolute good, and there's an absolute beautiful. We don't know exactly what they would have looked like. You can imagine kind of geometric shapes uh, as the way they tried to describe it. But you have these ideal forms, and then you've got all this kind of floating stuff, pre-existing matter everywhere. And Socrates and Plato argue that what happens is the god sees the good, the true, and the beautiful, is inspired by that, and then takes the floating stuff, the matter, and starts creating the universe. And this is where the universe comes from. It comes from the god trying to replicate these things. And so this is one way to understand the Socratic and Platonic understanding. Their belief is that everything in this world, everything, is a copy. So everything that we have here and now, my, my little recorder, there's a perfect recorder in heaven. My table here, there's a perfect table in heaven. There's a perfect Brad in heaven. There's a perfect you in heaven. There's a perfect desk. There's a perfect Kleenex, everything. That in the celestial realm, there is perfection. But the reason we're so flawed in this world is because we have been made in this image of the divine, but only made in the image of the divine. And we know what the divine is by reflecting on certain things so I can contemplate the beauty or the utility of this table, and then I can imagine what a perfect table would look like, but I'm not going to reach that kind of perfection. So this is a very different understanding in the way that Socrates and Plato put this. Aristotle would say, and you'll get to this on Friday and then Monday of next week, Aristotle would argue that we know a thing by what it does. That is, we see its end. We understand that this table is a fine table as long as it acts as a table and does what a table should. That's a little bit different than what Socrates and Plato are saying, because Socrates and Plato say that we know a thing because it is the reflection of that universal thing, which is true and good and beautiful, but we are merely shadows of that thing. And so this whole world, we are shadows of shadows of shadows. And you're going to read a piece for Friday called The Allegory of the Cave, in which the person comes out of this dark cave where he's only seen the shadows of things from the campfires on the walls. But as he retreats out of the cave, he begins to see true light And then when he sees true light, he recognizes that that light is the sun. And then when he sees the sun, he recognizes that there's something behind that sun. And this is all that kind of platonic, Socratic understanding that we know a thing because it reflects another thing or reflects what is true. Does this, I want to make sure this makes sense for everybody. So heaven is perfect. We are flawed. But everything here has its counterpart in heaven. There's nothing in this world that is not perfected in the next world. Does everybody at least understand how Plato, you don't have to agree with it, obviously, but I want you to understand how Plato and Socrates are arguing this. So we know things are good and true and beautiful through contemplation. So just by mere being, that is by existing, we know these things to be good and true and beautiful, Uh, but only here as reflections in eternity as something long and very organic and very necessary for creating what is here in this world, or at least reflecting what is in this world. So keep that in mind. That's the great distinction. Whereas Aristotle is all about what a thing does, what the end of a thing is, that is what its purpose is. That's what he's trying to do. So again, that reflection really matters. But it also matters that it's an organic reflection. So part of what Plato and Socrates are arguing is that we see here now in the natural law things that are eternally true, but we also have this organic thing. So the idea that we're born, we have a middle age, and we die, or that there is the tree from an acorn to the tree and then it withers, or that there's a spring and a summer and a fall and a winter. There is always this organic element as well for Socrates and for Plato. And they break down, I think importantly, as they're thinking about 
who the God is in particular and what we are, they break down the human person into three parts. That is, they break the soul down into three parts so that there is the head and then there is the chest and then there is the stomach. And each of these things reflect a different aspect of the eternal. So the head for Socrates and for Plato always, and for Aristotle as well, but the head always is representative of monarchy and rationality. The stomach is always representative of the democracy or our passions or animalistic side. So we have the head, which is very rational and computer-like, and then we have the stomach, which is very animalistic-like, and in between, for Socrates and Plato, we have the chest, which is about reason. And it's through reason that we see the highest things, because it's through reason that we see the truth reflected. So God projects himself in us. And again, if I can bring up a kind of Christian understanding here, this is very similar to what we see at the beginning of St. John's Gospel, where St. John says, what is the Logos? It is the light that lighteth up every man. Right? That imagination, that ability to see beyond ourselves. So in the in a present world, in 2021, we almost always use rationality, things of the mind, as a syn- synonym with reason. But for the Greeks, reason was something a little bit different. Reason was really the ability to see beyond ourselves. So one of the great ironies of reason, and we're going to keep talking about this for the rest of the semester, but one of the great ironies of reason is reason allows us to become fully human, but it's ironically the thing that is least human about us because it reflects what is divine. It reflects what is true. So, you know, again, to be Christian for a moment, imagine when Mary is told that she is going to be the Christ bearer. Her response is, my soul doth magnify the Lord. I, I reflect my Lord's love. And that, that's kind of a perfect, even though Mary had no, <laughs> as far as we know, she had not read these Socratic dialogues, but that response is this very, it's equal to the kind of understanding that Socrates would have. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the second half of the irony of reason? I Again, the irony of reason is, so reason is this thing, so our soul reflects what is mm-hmm. true. Reason is God placing his image in the soul, and therefore when we recognize the kind of divine within us, it's the thing that's least human about us, but it's what makes us human. So when I look at you, I don't just think of you as this person sitting here wearing a black long sleeve t-shirt, sitting there and describing who you are. Yeah. I actually see the reflection of God in you. I see your soul. That's, that's how Socrates and Plato. So when we look at another person, our reason is magnified by their reason, and that's reflecting the divine. Okay. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. Kind of. Yeah. It's kind of wild, but, but we see that. So, so the human being is mind, the stomach, but also the soul, which reflects the divine. And so that's where, that's the reason, for example, we in America have the three branches of government. And we have the executive, we have the president, we have the democracy, the House of Representatives, and then we have the soul, the Supreme Court, and the Senate, supposedly. The, the kind of being the aristocratic part, but the thing that reflects something long term, right? Reflects something wiser. John, does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else on this? Thanks. I know this is some crazy, crazy stuff, but good as well. Okay. So let's talk about Socrates then in particular. Why is there so much anger at Socrates? There's a lot of anger at Socrates because look, if you look at his date, it's 399 that he's executed by Athens. There's a lot of anger at Socrates because Socrates has spent the five years since Athens has been defeated in the Peloponnesian Wars walking around and arguing with people, trying to get them to see what reason is, so again, that divine element within themselves, but also trying to make them understand, and not in a very positive way, trying to make them understand that Athens can never become great again unless she understands why she lost the Peloponnesian Wars. And she lost the Peloponnesian Wars because, ultimately, she wasn't virtuous enough. That is, her citizenry wasn't willing to give enough to allow for the society to flourish. So Socrates is basically saying, 
we lost because you did not behave in a virtuous fashion. And he does one other thing, which really angers the Athenians. As he's walking around, he only talks about the god, not the gods. And therefore, they accuse him of atheism because he doesn't believe in the gods. He only believes in the god. And so they're resentful of this, and they can charge him by, as basically corrupting the youth. That is, he's not allowing the youth to be raised properly within an Athenian setting because he doesn't buy the polytheistic understanding. So Socrates, in the part that you read for today, really is broken down into two parts. We have this opening part called the Apology, where Socrates gives a speech to Athens, and he's in front of a jury, and the speech that he gives is a rousing speech, as we'll see here in just a moment, but it's also a, a very brutal speech against Athens, even though he's trying to, to try and understand or let them understand why he's going to accept capital punishment. But as he's doing so, he also is trying to appeal to their nature to get them to see the divine and to see what's rational and what's not, what's reasonable and what's not, and not to let them be ruled only by their passions. So he wants that to be played out within the Athenian understanding of society as well. So anybody want to just start here with the Apology? On page 79, we have two paragraphs from the Apology. It's a much longer thing than this. But Apology, by the way, just means defense. It doesn't mean he's saying he's sorry. It means he's explaining why he's doing what he's doing. So the Apology, again, is not an apology as we think of, but a defense of what he's doing. So anybody want to read? I'm happy to call on people, but yeah, thanks very much, Ross. So I'll have you read read this first paragraph, we'll talk about it for a second, and then we'll read the second, you'll read the second paragraph. Uh, the or not paragraph, section. Okay. The, the effect of these investigations of mine, gentlemen, has been to arouse against me a great deal of hostility and hostility of a particularly bitter and persistent kind, which has resulted in various malicious suggestions, including the description of me as a professor of wisdom. This is due to the fact that whenever I succeed in disproving another person's claim to wisdom in a given subject, the bystanders assume that I know everything about the subject myself. But the truth of the matter, gentlemen, is pretty certainly this that real wisdom is the property of God, and this oracle is his way of telling us the human wisdom has little or no value. It seems to me that he is not referring literally to Socrates, but has merely taken my name as an example, as if he would say to us, the wisest of, men, of you men is he who has realized, like Socrates, that in respect of wisdom, he is really worthless. That is why I still go about seeking and searching in obedience to the divine command if I think that anyone is wise, whether citizen or stranger, and when I think that any person is not wise, I try to help the cause of God by proving that he is not. Okay, thanks very much, Ross. So Socrates is a character. Right? Here he is. What is he doing? Well, my job is to show people how lacking in wisdom they really are. And why, why is it then? Why is it that the oracle says that Socrates is the wisest of men? What, what is it about Socrates that makes him so wise? And this is one of the great tensions of the dialogue. Stella. I, I, I think this is because I read the whole thing for a different class, but I think the implication is that Socrates is the wisest of all men because he knows he is not wise. Yes, no, that's exactly right. Socrates is the wisest of all men because he knows he is not wise. That's how Socrates presents this and what he thinks the oracle means. So the oracle would be... Yeah, the, the, basically the priest of, of the Greek religion. But the oracle says that Socrates is the wisest of all men because he knows nothing and knows he knows nothing. Now, we're going to find out that's obviously not true. There are a lot of things that Socrates knows. But he is willing to recognize and admit that he himself only knows certain things and only knows those certain things because of the God. And so he's going to play into that idea of the God. Now, this is, this is where it gets really complicated. Because if reason is this thing that is reflected within us, then it means that our true and highest understanding, if reason is our way of understanding something, we really only know something through mystical means. 
And Socrates is very mystical about this. Only when God gives us this knowledge or gives us this understanding, that can happen in conversation, that can happen in a dream, as we'll see here right away. Socrates has this very powerful dream that affects him deeply. It can be a remembrance, that is kind of a remembrance of what it was like to live with God before we took human form. It could be any of these things, but these were ways that we knew. And that, that seems very contrary, especially, you know, think about on the first day of class or second day of class, we talked about Athens and the order of the mind, meaning, of course, that there was a kind of rational element in trying to understand Athens and trying to understand the Athenians, but now we get Socrates, who really is promoting reason, or this kind of mystical understanding of things, above pure rationality. So this is one of the great tensions in the dialogue. Socrates knows so much because he knows so little. He's willing to admit that there are many, many things he does not know. But there are also things that he absolutely knows, and those will become central to this dialogue. So if you're confused on this, please don't feel bad. This is a confusing dialogue, and there are a lot of tensions in it that have to be resolved. And probably the greatest one is Socrates saying, I am wise because I know nothing. And the oracle recognizes I am wise because I know nothing. Clearly, he knows a lot. But we also see here that he wants to be a lover of wisdom in some way, not just a professor of wisdom, but an actual lover of wisdom. All right. Do you want to keep reading? I can if you want me yeah, to. Yeah, you don't mind. Finish out that paragraph or how, how far? Yeah, read the gentleman I'm very grateful okay. down to the end of that. Gentlemen, I am very grateful. I am your very grateful and devoted servant, but I owe a greater obedience to God than to you. And as so long as I draw breath and have my faculties, I shall never stop practicing philosophy and extorting you and elucidating the truth for everyone that I meet. I shall do this to everyone that I meet, young or old, foreigner or fellow citizen, but especially to you, my fellow citizens, and as much as you are closer to me in kinship. This, I do assure you, is what my God commands, and it is my belief that no greater good has ever befallen you in this city than my service to my God. For I spend all my time going about trying to persuade you, young and old, to make your first and chief concerns not for your bodies nor for your possessions, but for the highest welfare of your souls, proclaiming as I go, wealth does not bring goodness, but goodness brings wealth and every other blessing, both to the individual and to the state. Now, if I corrupt the young by this message, the message would seem to be harmful. But if anyone says that my message is different from this, he is talking nonsense. And so, gentlemen, I would say, you can please yourselves whether you listen to Enetus or not, or not, and whether you acquit me or not, you know that I am going to alter my conduct, not even if I have to die a hundred deaths. Okay, thanks, Ross. Well read. So, yeah, Stella, please. Okay, well, I, re I remember thinking of this when I read it, but when you read it just now, it became even more crazy. The very first sentence of that is very much like what Thomas More said when he was asked to go against his beliefs. It's, I'm, very, I'm your very grateful and devoted servant, but I owe God a greater obedience. So I don't know, I think this is just another thing where, you know, Socrates, he may be a pagan and really long ago, but he is like a huge influence on everything. Yeah, and Tom, so Thomas More was a great figure of the Renaissance who was executed by his best friend, executed by the king, Henry VIII. And he does say, I am the king's faithful servant, but I am God's servant first, right? And that, so, and that, that's in 1535, right, yeah. when he's executed? Um, so, and he, he was one of the great Platonists of his day. So th there's no doubt that it comes from this. But I think that's absolutely right. This the Socratic influence is absolutely huge. Well, what do, we, what do we take from Socrates? I mean, you guys reading this, what do you think of? What do you think of him here? He's been given a chance to apologize and, and actually apologize. Say, I'm sorry. And I repent. And I promise I won't go do this again. And what's he do? Pretty much says no. Yeah, Hannah. Yeah, I was going to say he's pretty much coffee. Like he yeah. said, no greater good has ever befallen you in this city than my service to my God. Can you imagine? Right? You're on trial and your life is hanging in the balance. And by the way, I'm the greatest thing that ever happened to you. Right? And, and am I going to stop? 
absolutely not. If you let me go, I'm going to do this over and over and over and over again. And I would do this even if I were to die a thousand times. I'm going to keep doing this. So his apology is not an I'm sorry. It's a let me explain to you what I know. And who is he? who does he claim to be speaking for? Stella. He's God. He's claiming basically to be a prophet. He thinks he's a prophet. Absolutely. He thinks he's a prophet. And he does sound, even though we're not in any way in a Judeo-Christian world, he does sound very much like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or any of the other great prophets. And of course, what happened to those guys? Who loved the prophets? They're hated. Right? You, you love a prophet when he's dead. You hate him when he's alive. Right? And that's what happens over and over again. And Socrates is playing that role in Greek society, very similar to what the Jews and the great prophets in Judaism played within Hebrew society. Grace? Uh, just a quick question. Does he, would you say that he thinks he is just in claiming this? Of the, like the line, um, it is my belief that no greater good has ever befallen you in this city than my service to my God. Like, from his perspective, he sees himself as like a prophet. So then would he think like, oh, this is his due, like, this is what is like but he's not being arrogant in claiming this. Well, do you think he is? Well, I was asking you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, how do you take this? Obviously, this is going to have a huge influence on the, the whole rest, rest of Western civilization. So what do you, we have to kind of decide. Is, is he being humble or is he being arrogant here? Or is there that tension where he's being both in some way, which would be very Socratic? But do you have a thought, Grace? I think... I think from his perspective, he's, he's being... Not necessarily humble, but just stating it like it is. And I think in the way that history has played out, I don't think he's necessarily wrong in that because of how impactful his thoughts have become. Mm. But I don't know if, like, objectively at that time, he wasn't being arrogant from an outside perspective. Yeah, well, and of course, the, the jury, by the way, the jury's about 400 people, so don't, don't think of it as. You know, our jury, it was a, an assembly of, of citizens who were watching this. They, they go ahead and vote to condemn him to death after this. This does him no good, right? Except he says, you're going to do it anyway, and he tells them. He also tells them they will regret killing him because they will feel guilty once he's gone, which is true. They do, and they do regret it. But it's still going to be very powerful in obviously taking his life. So if Socrates is right... He can be both arrogant and humble at the same time. If he really is the voice of God, he can be both, right? Because there is something in that that is both humbling and at the same time exhilarating, being the voice of God, if he is really that. So, yeah, Kirsten. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting, like, in his reply, he doesn't give, like, I would say reasoning, like, in relation to, like, the city and the people, but he instead, instead he, like, uh, appeals to a transcendent power of yeah. the city and just the polis itself. Okay, let's, let's hold on to that for a moment. Let's talk about that. He appeals to a transcendent power. He appeals to God. He clearly thinks the decision to kill him is unjust, but he says he will die for Athens. So what does he mean by that? What is Athens for Socrates? And, Kristen, your point is very well taken. So what does he mean by it? Yeah, Elizabeth. I think he's saying he's willing to sacrifice himself for like the ideals that he stands behind. Yeah, the Athens. spirit of Athens yeah. rather than the actual letter of the law of yeah. Athens. So he thinks that the momentary decision by this democracy, and he mocks the democracy in a little bit, right? he thinks that is completely unjust. And yet he accepts this, even though he could walk away. Right? Nobody's going to stop him. If, if Socrates wants to walk away and go to another city-state, he can. He doesn't have to take the hemlock. I mean, they, they rule that he's going to have to take the hemlock. He's going to have to kill himself. That is, they kill him through the hemlock, through this poison. But he could have gotten away at any point. In fact, the city would have preferred that he got away. But he's going to accept the punishment because he believes that Athens over time, basically kind of like the voice of God, Athens over time is correct, even though that Athens at the moment is wrong. Yet another paradox and tension within Socrates. 
So he doesn't like the democracy ruling Athens, but he loves Athens as his community, and he's not willing to go anywhere else. Kirsten. So was, would you say Socrates would have been a believer in democracy? He's not. No, he probably believed, and like we'll see when we, so we're going to read Plato's The Republic, or you guys will, for Friday. I'm not going to be here. But uh, you'll see that he probably did believe in a republic more than anything else, but it would be a balance, a mix of the one, the few, and the many somehow in that government, more like what we have today than what the Athenians had as a strict democracy. So he thinks that democracy is being ruled, that's where the stomach comes in, it's being ruled by its passions and not by its reason or its rationality. So he's worried about that. Elizabeth. So did Socrates, did he, was he monotheistic or? He seems to be, okay. yeah, he seems to be a monotheist. So did yeah. he only believe in Zeus or was it a completely different God together? Well, he uses the expression the gods at one point in the dialogue, but it seems to be Zeus or the celestial king, however he wants to call it. So he is often taken, for example, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, he's seen as a proto-saint. So other churches don't go quite that far, but I mean, certainly within the Catholic Church, he's still regarded as a pretty important figure, kind of foreshadowing Christ in some ways, at least in a pagan way, uh, doing so. So you don't find as much of that in Protestant churches, but you definitely do in the more liturgical churches, that idea. Okay, yeah, Kirsten. It's kind of off topic. Oh, no, please. Um, so, like, I remember reading, like, Dante's Inferno. Sure. Dante put Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, I think, in the gate, like, before going into hell. Is this, in, like, any way relation to, like, their belief that even though they didn't necessarily believe in the Christian God, that they were, like, to a different standard, that they were so worthy of not... I guess, fully going to hell. Right. The belief, the belief was that they had at least understood that there was one God, and therefore it foreshadowed Christ, and it foreshadowed Christianity. So their punishment, or remember their punishment is just they have to listen to Aristotle lecture them for eternity. <laughs> right? That's their punishment. So that it's, uh, at least for Dante, that's their punishment. So yeah, that, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's good. Okay, well, let's read a little bit. Um, if somebody would be Socrates and somebody would be Crito, We'll start here right on page 80. So who wants to be Socrates? You don't mind, Olivia? That'd be great. All right, and who wants to be Crito? Crito doesn't have that, that high of a position here, unfortunately. He just gets to say things like yes and sure. But who wants that? Elizabeth, would you mind? Sure. That'd be great. Okay, so just start here already, Crito. Surely it is still early. Here already, Crito. Surely it is still early. Indeed it is. About what time? Just before dawn. I wonder what the warder paid, that the warder paid any attention to you. He is used to me now, Socrates, because I come here so often. Besides, he is under some small obligation to me. Have you only just come, or have you been here for a while? Fairly long. Then why didn't you wake me at once, instead of sitting by my bed so quietly? I wouldn't dream of such a thing, Socrates. I only wish I were not so sleepless and depressed myself. I've been wondering at you, because I saw how comfortably you were sleeping. And I deliberately didn't wake you because I wanted you to go on being as comfortable as you could. I have often felt before in the course of my life how fortunate you are in your disposition. But I feel it more now than ever in your present misfortune when I see how easily and placidly you put up with it. Well, really, Crito, it would be hardly suitable for a man of my age to resent having to die. Other people just as old as you are get involved in these misfortunes, Socrates, but their age doesn't keep them from resenting it when they find themselves in your position. Quite true, but tell me, why have you come so early? Because I bring bad news, Socrates. Not so bad from your point of view, I suppose, but it will be very hard to bear for me and your other friends, and I think that I shall find it hardest of all. Why, what is this news? Has the boat come in from Delos, the boat which ends my reprieve when it arrives? It hasn't actually come in yet, but I expect that it will be here today, judging from the report of some people who have just arrived from Sunium and left it there. It's quite clear from their account that it will be here today, and so by tomorrow, Socrates, you will have to, to end your life. Well, Crito, I hope that it may be for the best. If the gods will it so, so be it. All the same, I don't think it will arrive today. What makes you think that? Um, I will try to explain. I think that I am right in saying that I have to die on the day after the boat arrives. That's what the authorities say, at any rate. Then I don't think it will arrive on this day. That is just the beginning. But on the day after, I'm going by a dream that I had in the night, only a little while ago. It looks
looks as though you were right not to wake me up. Why? What was the dream about? I thought I saw a gloriously beautiful woman dressed in white robes who came up to me and addressed me in these words. Socrates, to the pleasant land of Pythia, Pythia on the third day you shall come. Your dream makes no sense, Socrates. <laughs> to my mind, Crito, it is perfectly clear. Okay, let's, let's stop there. That's good. So here we have Socrates, who clearly is moved by this dream. And this dream, again, talk about pre-Christian, right? the dream in the dream, a woman in white comes to him and says, in three days you will be in the land of Pythia. You'll be in the, the good, not in Hades, but in the land of your ancestors. You'll be with them. Right? The three days, the foreshadowing, the acceptance of all of this, it, it, you can see why later Christians, and especially as I mentioned the other day, you know, when Stoics were trying to be converted, that is when the, the Christians were trying to convert Stoics, who the, were kind of the main philosophical school of the Romans, the Stoics would respond by saying, look, we have Socrates, who was great, and you guys have David, who was terrible. And it was a real stumbling block, as I said, because Socrates seems to be so heavenly versus David, who was so worldly in the way that, at least the story that we have, that it caused a lot of people to really kind of not become Christian because of this. But Socrates is this great pagan hero, and as he says, right, his present misfortune is what it is. He's willing to die, so there's a very stoic element. Let's, uh, we're almost out of time, and I didn't realize how far we had been, how long we had gone. I want to uh, turn the page, page 85, and point out pages 85 through 87. And if someone would read again, actually, would you two mind reading a little bit more? So, uh, yeah, start with on page 85. Socrates, very good, will now tell me, Crito. Looks like it's line 13. Um, very good. Well, now tell me, Crito. We don't want to go through all the examples one by one. Does this apply as a general rule and above all to the sort of actions which we are trying to decide about? Just and unjust, honorable and dishonorable, good and bad. Ought we to be guided and intimidated by the opinion of the many or by that of the one, assuming that there is someone with expert knowledge? Is it true that we ought to respect and fear this person more than all the rest put together? And that if we do not follow his guidance, we shall spoil and mutilate, mutilate that part of us which, as we used to say, is improved by right conduct and destroyed by wrong. Or is this all nonsense? No, I think it is true, Socrates. Then consider the next step. There is a part of us which is improved by healthy actions and ruined by unhealthy ones. If we spoil it by taking the advice of non-experts, will life be worth living when this one part is when this part is once ruined? The part I mean is the body. Do you accept this? Yes. Well, life is worth living with a body. Well, is life worth living with a body which is worn out and ruined in health? Certainly not. What about the parts of part of us which is mutilated by wrong actions and benefited by right ones? Is life worth living with this part ruined? Or do we believe that this part of us, whatever it may be, in which right and wrong operate, is of less importance than the body? Certainly not. Is it really more precious? Much more. In that case, my dear fellow, what we ought to consider is not so much what people in general will say about us, but how we stand with the expert in right and wrong, the one authority who represents the actual truth. So in the first place, your proposition is not correct when you say that we should consider popular opinion in questions of what is right and honorable and good or the opposite. Of course, one might object. All the same, the people have the power to put us to death. No doubt about that. Quite true, Socrates. It is a possible objection. But so far as I can see, my dear fellow, the argument which we have just been through is quite unaffected by it. At the same time, I should like you to consider whether we are still satisfied on this point, that the really important thing is not to live, but to live well. Why, yes. And that to live well means the same thing as to live honorably or rightly. Yes. Then in the light of this agreement, we must consider whether or not it is right for me to try and get away without an official discharge. If it turns out to be right, we must make the attempt. If not, we must let it drop. As for the considerations you raise about expense and reputation and bringing up children, I am afraid, Crito, that they represent the reflection of the ordinary public, who put people to death and would bring them back to life if they could, with equal indifference to reason. A real duty, I fancy, since the argument leads that way, is to consider one question only, the one which we raised just now. Shall we be acting rightly and paying money and showing gratitude to these people who are going to rescue me and in escaping or arranging the escape ourselves? Or shall we really be acting wrongly and doing all of this? 
If it becomes clear that such conduct is wrong, I cannot help thinking that the question whether we are sure to die or to suffer any other ill effect for that matter, if we stand up our ground and take no action, ought not to weigh with us at all in comparison with the risk of doing what is wrong. I agree with what you say, Socrates, but I wish you would consider what we ought to do. Let us look at it together, my dear fellow, and if you can challenge any of my arguments, do so and I will listen to you. But if you can't, be a good fellow and stop telling me over and over again that I ought to leave this place without official permission. I'm very anxious to obtain your approval before I adopt the course which I have in mind. I don't want to act against your convictions. Now give your attention to the starting point of this inquiry. I hope that you will be satisfied with my way of stating it. And try to answer my questions to the best of your judgment. All right, and this becomes the critical part, these next few lines. Well, I will try. Do we say that one must never willingly do wrong, or does it depend on circumstances? Is it true, as we have often agreed before, that there is no sense in which wrongdoing is good or honorable? Or have we jettisoned all our former convictions in these last few days? Can you and I at our age, Crito, have spent all these years in serious discussions without realizing that we were not better than a pair of children? Surely the truth is just what we have always said. Whatever the popular view is, and whether the alternative is pleasanter than the present one, or even harder to bear, the fact remains that to do wrong is in every sense bad and dishonorable for the person who does it. Is that our view or not? Yes, it is. Then in no circumstances one must one do wrong. No. In that case, one must not even do wrong when one is wrong, which most people regard as the natural course. Apparently not. Tell me another thing, Crito. Ought one to do injuries or not? Surely not, Socrates. And tell me, is it right to do an injury in retaliation, as most people believe, or not? No, never. Because I suppose there is no difference between injuring people and wronging them. Exactly. Okay, right there. This, this section is so important. Just mark this page up, page 87. This is what we call the Socratic ethic. And it's a hard, hard teaching, right? When you were wronged, you must not wrong somebody. Even though you probably have just in doing so, you still must not do it. You must never do the wrong thing, even if it's for the greater good. Right? If you do the wrong thing for the greater good, you've corrupted the good. And this is tough. So imagine, long before any of us were alive, but imagine during World War II when we decided to drop the atomic bombs on two cities. Right? That's the kind of thing, and I'm not, I'm not here to argue that, but Socrates would have said, you have done a wrong, and therefore, even if it ends the war ending, you have corrupted the good of what could have been accomplished. So you can never, ever do the wrong thing in any circumstance and pretend that it's the right thing. The wrong thing will always be the wrong thing, and it will always taint the good. Yeah, Kate. So is he saying, like, if someone stabs you, you just got to bleed out and <laughs> He He actually does seem to be saying, I mean, you can, you can run, yeah, not very, this is hard for America. <laughs> this, this is really hard. Right? We, we like to shoot back. Um, he's basically saying you can't do that. that. So he would say the whole Peloponnesian War was actually wrong, wouldn't he? Well, he was a war hero, and, during, and he had fought during the war, but it depends on how you fight. So he's not actually, again, there are times when war is just, mm -hmm. but it has to be fought on just principles. So his argument against, say, the atomic bomb would not be that a bomb is unjust, but bombing a civilian society, bombing the civilians would be unjust. But war can be just, depending on how it's determined. But that's a great question, Kate. And we have to ask, how far are we willing to take this with Socrates? Yeah, Stella. The whole aspect of justice makes me think that Socrates would not say self-defense. He's wrong, Loki. If someone stabbed Maybe. you, you couldn't defend yourself? You can defend yourself. Yeah, but I don't think he would say it was okay to kill the person. You don't retaliate and yeah, kill them. Yeah, you just yeah. defend yourself. No, I think that's absolutely, that, that's a very fair way of putting it. So self-defense is one thing, but retaliation is something very different. So, okay, again, foreshadowing, who does this sound like? Jesus. Turn the other cheek, right? <laughs> so Socrates got there pretty early. Okay. Uh, sorry, guys, I took you up. Uh, we've got 10 seconds left. I want to hand back your... Every, any big final questions? Or everybody understand? I know Socrates is confusing, and there should be tensions, but... Okay, I want to thank you very much for your, your quizzes. As I said, I was really impressed with them, and I'm glad that you are where you are and where we are. So, Stella...